Okay, this is the last lecture. We'll um, we'll start in a few minutes. I'll give people a chance to join. Chad, I started a little bit late. I'm sorry about this, but um, yeah, we're nearly there. So uh, we will get the slides sorted in a few minutes. Not too much to do today, but we'll um, we'll get there. Thanks for waiting. Look at chat. Um, yeah. Hi, Emer. Hi, Lara. It's nice to see you here. Thank you very much for coming. Right, I think we'll start proper. Um, this is the last live stream for CS230 this year. Um, from the outset, I'd like to thank you for your participation in the module. Um, it's been a tough one. It's been a tough year, a strange year. And uh, I, I found it hard going myself. Um, I'm sure you did as well. <laughs> and uh, I only have two modules to deal with. You have a lot more than me. But um, I think it was quite rewarding. Um, I learned a lot this year. I learned a lot more. Um, I learned something every year. You know, every time you teach something, you learn something new. And um, you know, it gives you, even something you've done before it gives you a chance to to really think about it a little bit more deeply. And 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 again, it also is the same with teaching. You you think, well, will this work, or does it work, or did it work before? Does it work now? Does it not work. What can you do? Um, so I learned a lot, and that's mostly down to you guys um, and your help, your feedback. I really appreciate it. It was uh, super. And, um, you know, you're not shy about letting me know when I do things wrong or need to improve. And you're also not shy about letting me know when I do things well. So um, it's, uh, it's great to have that balance. And um, I hope that, that it works well for everybody and that we'll, um, you know, I'll, and certainly that you've learned something and that I'll do better next time. You know? um, so today's lecture is a slightly strange one. I'm just going to review um, the year in many respects. And ultimately, I do want to get to the point where, you know, you have and, and, and explain the steps we took in order to get to designing and developing this RESTful API. And the API, of course, that we've been working with is this one from this literary quotations database that you've seen. We start in, I think, week 10 um, and then we worked through it in week 11, and this week's one will just show you how to put an angular front end on there. It's quite complicated, but I think it's, um, it's not too bad. Um, it works quite well, but we'll come back to that in a few minutes. So we wanted to get to this point. And of course, you've seen a couple of other short examples that I've given you in the bonus videos as well. Slightly different approach to this one. And um, I guess for the examination, um, I don't mind what you use in order to pull all these things together. You know, choose a platform that, that works for you. And we, we'll discuss that as we move through this now. Day. And if you've got questions, you can post them in the chat. I'm quite happy to, um, to take them. And um, this one's a little bit more slower pace, and you'll be glad to know there's only a couple of slides. I really want to give you a sense of, of what you've achieved, okay? And, and you have achieved a lot, an awful lot, over the last 12 weeks. Um, let's look at this, okay? So Okay, we're in the last week, um, lecture 23, lecture 24. I've already uploaded the lectures for 23 and 24. Sorry, I've already uploaded the lecture for 24. Something to note that in this particular one, there are, there are only four lessons okay, uploaded because lesson three was 20 minutes rather than 10 minutes. I don't want to overburden you. So you're still getting the 50, the 50 minutes associated with that lecture, but it's, um, 
it's uh, broken into four lessons. You know, and, and in many respects, you know, you can just look at lesson three. It will probably provide you with all the information you need if you're stuck and you just want to see a little bit about how you might tie AngularJS in with this front end here that we're using. In fact, I know many of you have been looking at, at, at React.js, for example, you know, and um, and uh, some other platforms, okay, and other, other libraries in order to be able to build front ends. And, and, you know, and I'm happy with whatever you use, really. I'm just more concerned with you getting solutions and then um, having this um, mean type architect we learn i have no problem with whatever you choose and it could just be straight jquery vanilla html i don't mind as long as you're able to create an api consume that api and so forth and st have persistent storage in the database so, so that's it um i said they're online already um should be there have a look at them if you can and um, uh, they're probably they're probably um it's fairly complex, you know, the Angular is quite complex to do, in a, in, but I think I've taken you through how it works and it should be a good demo of it there. And all the code, I think, I, I don't think I put the code up yet, but I must do that a little bit. All right, so this is the slide for the lecture, okay? We have one, one slide today to talk about. Um, and really I wanted to talk to you about, you know, where you actually got here. Um, so you now, at the very beginning, we, we focused on a little bit about talking about where we wanted to get to this situation. We, we looked at, you know, started, we started with the browser. Okay? We, we absolutely started with what happens in the browser. Okay? And the browser, um, from your perspective, um, relied on three things in order to be able to build a user interface. And we want to be able to engage with content or engage with apps that we develop in this online environment. So we started off by looking at HTML, which is a way to structure content. And then we looked at CSS, which was a way to style that content. And we looked at JavaScript, which was a way to interact with that, with content. And so, you know, you did a couple of assignments, you know, that really worked, maybe three assignments actually, that worked a little bit more about trying to look and manage um, and up those skills to do with um, HTML, CSS, and JS. We looked at a little bit of theory around all of that, um, and you know it was a it was a useful exercise in order to be able to get you up to speed quickly. Um, and I know some of you found it tough, and it was tough, and some of the assignments were tough, and that's for sure. But it was like a baptism of fire. You know, you're really immersed in this, and um, and you did a great job actually. So I, I mean, I was very impressed with this. But this browser was key, and it is key because that's everything we want to do sits with this. Okay, and the browser may run on your your machine it may run on your phone on your tablets it could run anywhere so i'll think a little bit about the sort of stuff we didn't do okay we didn't talk about for example responsive design and we didn't talk about how you might build or write um front ends that are responsive and that will work really you know on whether you're on a, a mobile or whether you're working on a large screen or you're working on tv or you have some kind of display so we didn't explicitly talk about that. I know many of you, as and, and as I do myself, use Bootstrap and other and other libraries in order to be able to build UIs. And these are inherently um, responsive in themselves. So they will respond and adjust uh, according to the size of the display that's available. Um, but a lot of the stuff that we would have looked at and, looked at and developed won't necessarily work across all the various devices. And for your own personal and professional development, it would be a good idea to perhaps look a little bit about responsive design. Um, and if you're, if you're um, taking my other module on CS280, the, I will be uploading some lectures this week on responsive design from a theoretical perspective, but I will do a little bit of a demo at the end of that. So there's a bit of a crossover there between the CS280 and CS230. So we then, you know, we were looking at all this time. So we started off, you know, we were, we were looking at, you know, maintaining data in memory or in storage and so we were everything was stored in the browser in in, um, in javascript right so we needed to get get that stuff into what we would refer to as persistent storage or a database now you've done databases before so you looked at relational database from a previous year and you were able we know that you could store relational type data in that database so as a priority, I thought it would be a good idea if we could actually look and think a little bit about um, uh, databases and how they could be used and handled and accessed over a network. 
because a lot of the time you would have been doing this using online tools and you were actually talking to these databases remotely in my specs because they would have been on a web server in the department or you know they could have been running on your machine as well of course but may not have been and then and so you were actually talking to them so we wanted to be able to see how do we write programs that can do this so that allowed us to be able to build servers or services so we we and the purpose of this particular module in many respects is to expose the different approaches to working with servers and services. The traditional server is this LAMP type architecture. So this is the Apache web server running on Linux and um, either sitting under um, or, or as we know, it will work with Windows. It works with Mac OS um, and it also utilizes um, a way to extend that server so it doesn't just serve pages because traditionally you know the web servers all they did was serve these pages to the browser which were html and and that was it html you know, there was very little styling available then it moved to a situation where it could serve the css and then of course it could serve the javascript so the javascript you know was mostly in lamp type architectures as they're called and it it would serve the javascript we wouldn't have javascript running on the server as such but we didn't need, um, in order to be able to, over time, we didn't need to be able to update our servers in a way that we could um, add additional functionality. So we could start processing data and be able to have this loop where we had data coming from the browser across to the server, processed and back again. We would then either you know, serve pages that were already stored on the server, or we would dynamically generate pages and send them back to the browser. So when that was done, this loop here between the browser server browser, that loop um, was crucial, then we needed to have some way of extending the server. And one way that we originally did this was like was using writing extensions um, in C that would would extend Apache. But you could um and did people did use Perl for this, but mostly they would use PHP. Now um we looked a little bit about PHP and uh, because it came with the service and it it and seamlessly integrates with Apache. It's really nice. It's very mature technology. It's been around a long time. And so we then, um, once we knew we had a way of being able to capture information that was sent from the browser to the server and process it and generate pages, PHP would serve well for that setup. In order to be able to understand how all of this thing works, these blue line and, and, and green line here that we look at, this was a HTTP communication between the browser and the server and the server and the browser. And it's a protocol that we use in order to be able to exchange information and data between these stateless devices, stateless systems. And so we needed to be able to understand that protocol. So we spent a little bit of time talking about it and, and, and looking at and examining HTTP. I showed you how to write HTTP commands manually and send them using clients other than the browser. We could actually use standalone programs from the command line to talk to servers. And we saw how we could write servers that would pretend to be HTTP servers or web servers. Um, and we looked initially how to do these very, very simply um, using Netcat, for example. And later on, we, we learned how to write standalone services using Node.js, which was a, so a JavaScript software that runs on a server side. So we, we had this loop working anyway. We were able to browser, server, server, browser, all hinging around HTTP. So we could get forms, for example, and fill in forms, process the data, send it to the server, and then be able to respond back to the next step then that happened was that we were going to be able to save this data that was sent. So in a persistent kind of way, and this is persistent storage as so we had it back then to our MySQL database, and we were able to pop the data that came from the browser via the server into our database. And then we were also able to retrieve the data from the database back to the server. So we had these loop, we had two loops happening now. We had the browser server browser loop, and we had the server database server loop. So we had two loops running. And that all worked out very nice for us and, and it works fine. Some of the issues and problems, and I mean, this is the way the web worked for quite a long time, in fact. We noticed, however, that because a lot of the time we weren't able to write single page applications with this browser and server, this browser connection. So the page that was returned from the server was often overwriting the page with the browser. 
So we have to have some way of maintaining state or persistence, sometimes on the client side as well. So this is why we ultimately would need cookies. And those cookies would be a way of preserving and maintaining state from one page reload to the next page reload. And you can have server side cookies as well, which where we would have some kind of persistence storage or persistence here on the server side um, in terms of where we were in terms of the app that was running. A much better way ultimately was to be able to talk to the server and capture the output of the server in some kind of variable that was held inside the page that we were working. So we load a single page, have some variables in here that manage the data, and then those those um, variables will be updated with data that was sent back and forth to the server using Ajax, which is an asynchronous communication system that basically runs with Java script. And then, and it allows us to be able to make HTTP requests back and forth to the server and not overwrite the page. So we load that single page in the, in the browser once, and then we can update it or populate it with data, which is likely to have been retrieved from the database. So we have a much nicer way of generating these standalone single page application apps. Very powerful, very useful. So we, we now can talk to the server and ultimately the database via the server without having to reload a page. And that's why we had Ajax. You will notice, of course, that if you're using a browser, there are many different types of browsers. You might use Chrome. I use Safari. I use Chrome as well, of course. You know, you could have Edge server. You could have older, older servers. You could have Opera, Firefox, whatever. But a lot of these services behave in, in, in different ways when it comes to the document object model, which is the way the page is represented within that browser, and certainly within the way the JavaScript works internally in that particular browser. So we needed a way in order to be able to consistently write a single piece of code inside the browser app that will work across all browsers without change. And that's how you needed to have some libraries like jQuery. This is why we looked at jQuery, because jQuery provides you with this consistency across the different browser types in order, you know, so that we don't have to write different pieces of code for different kinds of services. So, and this is an optimized, optimized piece of code that will be loaded in and you can work with it. We did a lot of stuff manually so that you would have a sense of how you would write these pieces of software. I mean, if you were just web developers, it would be okay just to learn about using the software. But you are all software engineers and computer scientists. You're the kind of people who will need to write these libraries and understand these libraries and understand how they work and the necessity for them. So that's why... I would force you in a way, and it sometimes seems like I'm forcing you to be able to do it, the vanilla hardware, hardcore, low level stuff because you're computer scientists and software engineers. And I expect more from you than I would if you were just doing some web dev. You're not just end users, consumers, you know, you're actually innovators and developers of the core technologies or will be, you know, or expect you to be at some point, you know, you will be the future people who will be developing these libraries. So you need to know how it works at a core level first so that you can develop new things. You know, I mean, the web in two years time will be very different to the web it is now. And in 10 years time, it'll be, you know, it will be <laughs> unimaginable as to how these things will be. But I need you to be prepared for that. That's why I would focus on you doing a lot of the hardcore stuff without libraries. So you gain a good understanding of the way everything hangs together. Okay, might seem cruel, might seem tough thing, but there's a reason behind all this. Why I've said it on, um, but, Nevertheless, you got to the point where you could use jQuery, then it was okay to use jQuery Ajax rather than having to do all that, that hard, long-winded stuff as well. It also meant that you get a sense of understanding how object-oriented JavaScript will work. At so now we have that. That means that we're now in a situation where our, we can talk to our browser in a nice, well-understood, cross-browser compatible way. We can talk to servers. We talked a little bit about, you know, having... Um, about cores where we had cross origin issues where we were trying to talk to services on different servers, you know, and combine them. And we looked at the theory around all of that and we saw lots of examples on this, how it might work and how we might fix that. And the technicalities around HTTP and how, you know, you can build secure apps. And we, we pretty much had this 
nice tiered architecture, this layered architecture um, that we had. Um, and there was, and we, you would have heard me refer to this as a stack. So we had the front end stack, the middle, the server, and the, the database tier of that stack. We did learn and we did discuss and talk about the fact that some of these servers that would be HTTP, Apache HTTP based traditional web servers, if you like, were going to be very heavy, you know, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be lightweight services. Okay. And we, 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 we walked a little bit about, we talked a little bit about maybe trying to move from servers to services. Okay. And in order to do that, that meant that we wouldn't just have a general purpose server into which we embedded or added some services. We would actually just write small services that had servers embedded in them, HTTP servers. So it's like turning it on its head a little bit, and it's a, a different way to think about this. So we don't have a server with embedded services. We have a service that can be accessed over HTTP. And that's why we talked about Node.js. And Node.js is just really JavaScript on the server side. Now I could have chosen Python. I could have chosen Python with Flask or, or some other pieces. I could have looked at Ruby, you know, lots of things I could have looked at, but I chose Node.js because um, you don't have a lot of time um, to do all of the stuff that's required for this particular module. And you'd already been familiar with some, some syntax of JavaScript. And I thought it would be nice to have a single language working its way right through all tiers in the stack. It's also expected you know, for people who want to be able to do full stack development. So that's why we did this, okay? So we set up and started working with servers. And again, I had an approach you know, where Node.js has a huge number of libraries available to us for accessing and building APIs, and for example, with Express, but I wanted you to do everything manually. Again, so that you get a sense of how all of these things work, get a sense of greater sense of pulling together and working with HTTP because you're computer scientists and software engineers. You're not just end users or consumers of this technology. I want you to really understand it so that you could write your own libraries a little bit. Later. And you will do, you know, and you will be the better for it, you know, and, and, um, and I know you will be. Um, you know, I have great faith in you that you, you can do a good job with all of this. Okay? But you do need to know where these libraries come from and how we can make them easier. And by looking and doing it the hard way and then the easier way afterwards, you have a greater appreciation for, for the new way. And also gives you some insight into, you know, how you can take an existing piece of code and package it in a way that could be useful for, for other technologies later or services. And you'll certainly be expected to be able to do this when you go to companies work for your placement, for example. So that's the plan with all of this. And so we worked and looked at building small services that also access databases. We got to the point then, so we had, you know, multiple browsers, which were different types, which we could handle, you know, very easily using jQuery. Then we looked at different server types, which we could be using um, where we had like big servers with services embedded or small lightweight services with HTTP service servers embedded, you know, we too. And then we looked at the database and said, hmm, we just had one way of doing this and this was the MySQL and relational approach. And so what I wanted to do then was a exposure to different ways of modeling and looking at organizing data. And we'd already known about how we, we package up and send data between the browser and the server was in JSON. So it would be a good idea to be able to extend that because it minimizes the amount of processing at all the intermediary steps if we actually had some JSON type structure for a database. And this is why we started to work with MongoDB. So when you work with MongoDB, it stores data in JSON type structure in BSON. Um, and, and it's a way for us to be able to take data from the browser through the server and into the database store without having to change it too much. That's a huge amount of time saving. You know, if you're a, a large online service that's processing millions and millions of queries per hour, you know, and you're trying to do, can you imagine you're being Amazon or some big company like this, and you're trying to sell lots and lots of things. Microsecond, milliseconds count in terms of the productivity of a business. So we don't want to be doing all sorts of changing of data types from one format to another. Have the same format and push it right through the whole. It's, it's much, much better for this. Okay. So this is why we would do this. So we looked, at, but also we were looking at different ways of organizing data. 
And of course, it's not a, a new database module, you know, and you do, it's new for you to look at MongoDB. We didn't, we didn't spend too much time, but I did talk a little bit about in some of the lessons on how, you know, you model data, you know, onto many relationships, all this kind of stuff, just to show you that there's a similar theory around data organization when you work with collections and modeling in, in MongoDB, as you would have if you were looking at relational database management and modeling using entity relationships. Approaches. So, you know, we, we now have two options here, okay, for, for um, our database as well. Two options for database, two options for the services, two options, many options for browsers. And, you know, we're set to look at all the different ways and, and it prepped us a lot for how we might look at modern web and be able to look at a web server, go to a service that you use and have some sense of how it was built. My ultimate goal is just that you can understand how something is built by looking at it, by looking at the code, by thinking about the back end, by looking at how behavior will work, and so forth. But we could do all of these things, and they were very much tied. Every, every component was tied together. So we built a browser component, we built a server component, we did a database component, and they were all really seamlessly tied together. You know, so that we couldn't reuse a lot of these things. If you needed to make changes to the server, you probably have to make changes everywhere. You need to update the database. Everything had to be changed. And it became very, very complex. So we, now, we started then to think about and talk about CRUD. Okay? And this CRUD, we're, we're, we're looking at CRUD in a way that would be, would be, um, could be improved. Create, retrieve, update, and delete. And they're mostly the kind of things that we want to be able to do when we deal with data centric storage and retrieval in an online database or an online app and so once we have crud in play we think about crud we say well how can we best use crud how can we set up a system in place that we would make this work and that's why we started looking at rest and rest you know we looked at a theory of rest and we decide then well how do we map crud onto rest and that's what we've been doing for the last couple of sections of the course and the last few lectures. And we, we um, found good ways to do this. And the reason we did this was because we were able to build an option for the server that would be independent of the browser. And it, it's a well-defined interface that allows the, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, the service to be accessed by any kind of client that understands this RESTful API connect call. So we didn't, okay so, okay, so we did this, and then we made sure that the, the back end of the service that talks to the database was hidden from the user. They don't really need to know how that works. All they need to know is how do we access and manipulate and move the data via the API. And that's what we did, okay? And we, we demonstrated that possible because we used tools, third-party tools like Postman, we use tools like Insomnia, browsers. We actually use standalone programs to be able to consume the API. In other words, to be able to engage with the API that was running on the service. <coughs> Excuse me. So that meant then that the browser parts would just be consumers as well. And they just needed to know how the API works. And that was, that's what we've been doing for the last while. And then Everything else is hidden, so we could have a database. In principle, your API, in terms of the design, should always focus on the clients of that API. They need to only know about how front end and how that API works. So if you're writing an app box to, that has a front end and a back end, often it's a good idea to work on designing the API first and the communication here between these two, then you don't have to worry about how that API is actually implemented. I've been working with APIs that, that over the years that, you know, first of all, started out, you know, in Perl. We had APIs then that migrated and changed over to Java. And then we moved over to Node.js. You know, we, sorry, we had PHP in there at one point as well. And, 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 but as far as the user was concerned, the front ends all worked in the exact same way. The front end never had to change because the backend servers, so the line languages changed, everything changed, but the CRUD activities 
implemented as a REST API didn't change at all. It allows us to, to be able to um, run these services and update the services and check them and make sure so we, without having to actually let the user know. We could completely change the operating language of servers and services without the user being aware. We just switched over because of this organization. Similarly, we're also able to maintain all of these parts, these browser and server parts, and change databases and organization because all that part would be hidden from the user. And we were able to write pieces of software that would be able to migrate from one server type to another server. So we were able to take data that was in a MySQL database and migrate it to a, to a, a, a relational database. Oh, sorry, did I say the same thing there? From a relational database to a collection-based database, which is like MongoDB, sorry. <laughs> um, so we can do that. And that's, for example, why I would ask you to do that kind of thing in one of the exam questions that you saw me talk about last week in last week's lesson. It wasn't live streamed, of course, um, but it's available for you to look at. So, you know, being able to move data around in the back end so that because you might want to switch services or switch kind of um, how the back end of the API services work might involve you switching or changing databases. So I'd like you to know how to do that and write programs to do that. And then a bit of data translation and all that work. Good, good practical experience and work for you, you know, should you be should you be hired as some kind of data data engineer um, for your placement or in the longer term when you get. So, you know, there's lots of places in there's lots of opportunities to work in the various tiers, but also for full stack as well, should you wish to be able to do this. Um, and then you know, so I think that covered pretty much all the things that we wanted to be able to do in this module. That's a huge amount. Okay? That's a huge amount of work. You should be really proud of yourselves at having got from not knowing much to being able to do things the right way and in an organized way and a professional manner and a way that's understood and accepted by industry. You are well prepared to be able to go into the workforce and understand you know, what's required and you just have to learn how that particular organization does it. You know, so you, you, might be, you might be worried about looking and saying, well, oh, there's this company I really want to work for. And they, you know, they are interested in building APIs, and, you know, but they're using Python and Flask. But look, it doesn't matter. You have like, but I've learned Node.js. But you have like 80% of the work done. Understanding how it all works and fits together. And it's a question of learning how to do the same thing that you know how to do with Python. You'll find that it works the exact same way. You'll find that there's a libraries that allow you to be able to implement REST APIs. Say Flask, for example, you know, um, with Python. And then it's the question of becoming familiar with the language. But don't dismiss how much you have learned in this particular module and how much you can translate to other positions and other technologies. You know, if some other data, so you might come across a graph based database, you might see, um, there are lots of, of graph-based databases, for example, now, which is another form of NoSQL. Um, and uh, it's a nice way of organizing graph-type structures, like social media data or something for data mining and so forth. And you think, well, I'm using MongoDB. Well, you know, OK. So learn a little bit about the graph technologies. Nothing else will change. The services will still be the same. You just have to understand how that particular database will work. Nothing else will change. The front end, the server, just the database tier change. You know, so it's very rare from now going forward that you will have to learn the browser, the server, service, and the database, all three. You know, it's, it's unlikely that that would be the case because you have a good handle on how each of these will work for the our module. So, you know, and it's also a great basis for the, um, the project, the third year project next year. It's also a great basis for your final year project and for your placements and, of course, applying for jobs. Make and keep a portfolio of all of these things so you can demonstrate you know, what you've learned from them. And you have learned lots, okay, and can do lots, okay? Take my demo programs, modify them in a way, and work with them. Now, I should have another, just a final word about the exam, I suppose. I mean, I did talk about it at length last year, the last week, sorry. It would be a good idea if you choose a, a technology set and be really happy with a technology set. I'm happy for you to choose any set that you like. I don't mind what framework you use for front ends. I don't mind which services you use, whether you're using a LAMP type structure or you're using a Node.js type structure. I don't mind if you use databases um, that are built around MySQL or MongoDB. You can choose any of these options in order to be able to build a solution for me and we'll be able to correct them. 
um, and that's for the exam. So that's absolutely fine to, to do that. And I'm, I'm happy with this. I've said it before. I keep saying it, you know, use what you feel comfortable with and, you know, best to be good at one technology and know how to do everything with it rather than try to spread yourself across lots of different technologies and not really understand what's going on in, in any of them. Um, but um, so please do that. So one of the things I, I think would be um, useful is to look at this app that we've built. Now, I did build you an app um, earlier. Uh, I did a, with, the, with the demo and with the bonus lessons that I had. But this is the one that I've been using in the actual lessons. And a lot of students I noticed in the previous examinations do tend to use this one. Um, I take this and modify this in order to be able to make it work. So I just downloaded this from my web page in Moodle. I installed it. Um, you'll see that I had to actually install a bunch of the modules that didn't exist. I had to install Mongoose. I had to install um, HBS, the handlebars, for here as well. Um, I, um, I mean, obviously, I need to update my, my NPM on this machine. Um, that's for sure. But um, look, at work. I didn't have to do this. And this is a machine that this is a new machine that didn't have all sorts of stuff. Um, but um, I have my software running in port 3000. And I'm successfully connected to the Mongo database. And this is the one I just made my connection to Atlas. So, you know, if you're looking at something for your examination, then this is not a bad way to start. Okay, I mean, it's not as it's not as complex, I guess, as some of the things you're asked to do, but um, uh, it works okay, and it has lots of these things built in, um, all these filtering that works, and you know, a lot of this. If you understand how this works, then you'll have a good chance to be able to. Um, find this um, and to get something set up to be able to run your exam solution for your coding exam. So this is just a database, quote, literary database quotation. I'm drawn to this one, given the day is uh, May the 4th. Um, and uh, just to show you it working, here's a quote. It's not actually a literary quotation. Um, Star Wars comics is literature. Um, but um, this one from Darth Vader. And of course, those of you who are present and who are interested in the Star Wars universe will know that this is the standard quote that you hear. And of course, it's incorrect because Darth Vader said, no, I am your father, not Luke, I am your father. So let's go and update this. Um, so change this. So, oh, it's fine. We have these nice dialogues and modals appearing and um, updating it. Nice feedback. And we're updating on the live update. So it all works well for us. Um, just a couple of other quotations in here from Margaret Atwood, Emily Bronte, and Malcolm X. We could add a new one. We can just go here and add. And I mean, I would expect you to be able to do this as well. Let's have um, oh, quotation. Um, uh, well, let's try this one. Emmy or memories swarm you up from the inside, but they also tear you apart. Okay, so it's one. Um, oh, the author is um, Haruki Murakami. Murakami said, "Save this." And so, yep. Yeah, so here we have the the Murakami quote has just been added. Um, and he's warming up from the inside, but he also threw you apart. So, so it's um. It's fine, and we can update. We could delete any of these if we wanted, and it would be fine. And we can search on the database. We can search quotations on the list that's here. All sorts of things that we could do. And all this functionality is available for you to use and reuse in your assignments. It makes your software look good. You don't have to do much to be able to make it work, but it gives an enhanced interface to the database that you have. I mean, for this particular database, the back end is um, is MongoDB, um, and uh, I'm just as I'm connecting it, uses handlebars for for the, the templates and everything else. Just fairly straightforward. All all this this stuff is handled by um, all this layout, you know, the coloring, the highlights. Everything is done using Bootstrap. So it, it's you know, there's a lot of that stuff is done for you. So you can produce a really nice user interface um, by copying this 
and then start working at looking at the templates. You know, if you want to create an ad, then if you are asked, for example, in examination, to have um, five or six different fields, then it's just a question of updating this particular. So build on something that works. If I was you, I would make sure and, 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 and work from there. Um, you remember the coding examination for this particular module, um, is a 24 hour coding examination, you get 10% for the UI, you get 10% for the service, the backend service, and you get 10% for the database model. And you know, the, you know, the, you know, you can have some parts working, some other parts won't work, but it's still possible to get a fully working testable UI that's you know independent of the API, the REST API that's provided by the service, um, and also from from the database. So you know there's lots of ways to pick up marks and make it work. And here's the fully working app that's available for you to download and install. And you'll need to set up your own credentials, of course, for logging into Atlas Cloud. I would recommend use Atlas Cloud. I don't think I produced a version of this that works with relational databases. And um, I did have a version that works with uh, Angular, but it's hard going you know and uh, and um it was hard going for me as well but it's a uh, it's like huge amount of effort to get something that's that's still similar to this and this is a lot less effort so you know you have to decide on how those things work for yourself and when you go back to the tier you have to decide how you the choices you make for each of these tiers in order to make it work you could of course use angular here or or um um React, whatever. I mean, I just went for simple jQuery bootstrap stuff uh, around, built around handlebars and templating. So that was a nice, easy way for me because I'm lazy and I just did something straightforward for you. And it wasn't too much code to give you as well because I know you have to work through the code and make it work. And um, so it's, it's, um, it works fine. So I, I'd recommend taking this and working with it. I also, of course, gave you the one, the, the one I had the previous day, um, probably offline now, but it was this one. You know, and this works just kind of like it's a much simpler version. You'll see I'm reusing a lot of the bootstrap stuff as well. But yeah, it works okay as well, you know, and you can talk to it. And I did show you how to use this version for both PHP and for um, well, some version of the back end stuff of PHP with MongoDB and with um, MySQL. So all of these, this was in the bonus lessons and all the code, of course, is available for you as well. Um, but I certainly think you could probably move to this one useful lot to read but there's not too many not too many files to start working with and and it should be fine let me just kill the service here um um right yes i downloaded um week 11 demo files and everything worked just fine i just literally just started server.js i did have to install my hbs and mongoose the config file i had to set up myself so that i included my my um my um, details, um, but um, apart from that, it was fine. Okay, I'm a problem with lights today, but yeah, I think that worked fine. So that's pretty much everything covered that we've done. If you think about what we've done, we've done a huge amount of work, you've done great. Um, and we got lots of examples, we have nice portfolio pieces, um, and uh, you know, I think it's, uh, uh, you should be very proud of yourself for what you've accomplished. I was delighted to have you all um, participating in Safe to 30. It's been a great module for me, stressful at times, you know, <laughs> I have lots and lots of students, lots of questions. I hope I got to you all. Um, I know some of you found it difficult and, 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 um, and some of you found it easy, you know, I mean, that's the way these things go. Um, and, uh, you know, all feedback is gratefully appreciated. I just want to do better every year. Um, and, uh, because every year is different and then there's nothing been as different as the last couple of years, that's for sure. And uh, so I think we'll, um, we should be fine. And you can continue to talk to me right through until the exams are over and afterwards. And I look forward to seeing you next year in third year. If you're taking my um, software design module, then you're going to have me again. And maybe a good or a bad thing, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, I enjoy it anyway. So, um, look, thanks for coming along today. I'm, we're, we're finished about five minutes early, so I'll hang on. And if you've got questions, I can answer them in chat. Um, and of course, you can always send me questions in Teams or emails. And, and then just don't worry, right, about things. You'll be, um, you'll be fine. And if you have worries, then talk to me and I'll see if I can help. But um, 
you know, if you think there's a lot to learn, there is a lot to learn, but done a lot. Well done. Thank you very much.